everyone. Welcome to the Times of Industry show. This is Lira Gantz welcoming a first-time guest to the show, Mr. Andy Schechtman. And Andy owns milesfranklin.com, and uh, it's, it's a bullion dealership. I personally buy my own gold and silver from this bullion dealer, and he helps me store my coins as well. Welcome, Andy, to the show. Thank you, Lior. It's good to be here. I appreciate it very much. I want to start off with um, something that uh, you have a unique perspective on. Um, that most people do not. You're, you're, not only are you a bullion dealer, you travel a lot. Uh, you see a lot of people in terms of uh, inside of the industry, outside of the industry. Can you give me a bird's eye view of uh, the economy right now uh, as it pertains to your point of view? Yeah, well, thank you, Leo. I appreciate the introduction. I, um, I've been doing this for 29 years, um, 30 years, actually, just, just, just 30 a couple of days ago think about it but in any case it's been a long time and I want to take you back to the beginning um, and and work our way forward because I think that what's happened um, April 1st of last year actually uh, is the most watershed game-changing moment of my career and um, anyone who owns precious metals needs to listen to this and I mean that wholeheartedly so we go back to the 90s in the last part of last decade I could never understand why the central banks of the world were lining up to sell their gold so fast. You look at uh, Gordon Brown, Bank of England, he sold almost all of the Bank of England's gold as it approached $250 in 2000, 2001, 2002. But I could never understand why these institutions would uh, be in such a hurry to shed all of their gold when, you know, they're you would think it would be the, the foundation of any currency. Well, in any case, as of April 1st of 2019, it all made sense to me. So let me explain. April 1st of 2019 was the Basel III meeting. Now, every year, the central banks meet in Basel, Switzerland, uh, which is the Bank of International Settlements. That's the central banker's central bank. And they changed the rules April 1st of last year and nobody's talking about it. And I don't understand that, Lior. I think everybody should be talking about it. What happened at Basel III uh, in Switzerland, April 1st of last year, was gold was reclassified from a Tier three asset to a Tier one asset. So let's go back to the 90s. In the 90s, everyone was selling their gold. In fact, most of the central banks signed on to something called the Washington Agreement. And the Washington Agreement was an agreement that limited the amount of gold that the central banks could sell to 500 metric tons, so as to not completely destabilize the gold market. And it, it never, it just never resonated with me. Why are they doing this? Why are they selling their gold so uh, with, with such vengeance that they have to sign on to an agreement that limits it to 500 metric tons? There are four reasons. There are four reasons that now are very crystal clear to me. And um, so let's take a look at them and then see how it's changed. Number one, gold costs money to store. You have to pay a storage fee. Number two, gold doesn't pay any interest whatsoever. Number three, gold is unpredictable. There's no guarantee that it moves up or it moves down. It's unpredictable. But the biggest reason that the central banks were lining up to sell their gold over the last 20 or 30 years has been because gold was a tier three asset. Now, the only tier one asset on the planet prior to April 1st were U.S. dollars and treasuries, the ultimate form of credit, as we're told. Um, a tier three asset, Lior, only allowed the banks to declare 50% of the value of the underlying asset on their balance sheet. So imagine what a central banker would think, especially the young ones, the new ones who didn't have the perspective, perhaps, that the old gray hairs did regarding what gold's role should be in any portfolio. But the younger guys would come on board and gals and they'd say, geez, you know, cost money to store, not earning any interest, unpredictable, and we can only declare 50% of its value. That denigrates our ability to write bonds and to transact international business. Why do we want this crap? And so the impetus would have been to sell gold and accumulate US treasuries and US dollars which would enable them to uh, have a better return and not denigrate their ability 
most importantly, to write bonds and to do international business. As of April 1st of last year, that has changed. Gold is now the only tier one asset on the planet next to US dollars. And that should really sink in for a second. The only other tier one asset on the planet next to US dollars and treasuries is now gold. What does that mean? Well, what that means is, is that it's a one-to-one -one relationship. It is the ultimate form of collateral. And I think that the central banks take care of themselves. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into this in a second. But the central bankers take care of themselves, Lior, and I think that they were alerted to this probably in 2017, that this change was coming. Because in 2018, the trend of selling gold completely reversed by the central banks. And they went from selling their gold to accumulating, as a group, more gold than at any time in the previous 55 years. 2019, that number was up almost 90%. This year, 2020, every little central bank from South America to Eastern Europe is gobbling up gold. They are de-dollarizing. They are accumulating the only other tier one asset on the planet opposite US dollars. But the question should be asked, why? Why did this happen? Well, we can take a look at the report that the Treasury publishes every year. It's supposed to come out in February. It hasn't come out yet. But last year's report, which talks about the year before, showed some numbers in the United States that are really startling. It said by their own admission that on top of a $22 trillion debt, they were $53 trillion in the hole in regards to Social Security and admitted that by 2034 it would be insolvent. So just between those two accounts, Social Security and our national debt, that's $75 trillion in the hole. A trillion seconds ago, Lior, was 31,688 years ago. The numbers are so big, it's over. But they went on to say, but wait, we have more debt, unfunded, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government and military pensions that exceed $100 trillion. So our total debt is north of $122, $123 trillion, both funded and unfunded. Uh, and so they said, well, but don't worry, we have assets too. They said, we have $3.8 trillion in assets. Do you know what the single largest asset is in the United States right now, Lior? The single largest asset in the United States, according to the U.S. Treasury, is student debt. Five, six years ago, they passed a law that said you cannot bankrupt yourself or die and absolve yourself of student debt. It passes on to your heirs or will, they'll attach your Social Security. It is considered the singular largest asset of the United States, according to the United States Treasury, of $1.8 trillion dollars kind of pathetic if you think about it, a country that is $120 trillion in the whole has asset base of $3.8 trillion, of which over half of it is student debt, and half of the Democratic Party wants to forgive it. I don't want to go down that road. Don't get me started there. But suffice it to say, I think if, if you take a step back and ask yourself, why would the central banks reclassify gold uh, as the only other tier one asset? Why have they been accumulating it so vehemently over the last couple of years? This is a good explanation. The bottom line is this. They take care of themselves first. And I truly do believe they are taking the time to position themselves out of, out of the dollar, to sell treasuries, to sell dollars, and to accumulate gold, which I believe will be the foundation of a new world reserve currency. In fact, when I speak at the Sprott Show every year in July, I show a slide this last July that J.P. Morgan Private Wealth published and sent out to their wealthiest clients. J.P. Morgan Private Wealth, Lior, is a division of J.P. Morgan that works with the wealthiest people in the world, the centimillionaires and the billionaires. And they sent out a letter to all of their depositors saying, we want you to uh, mitigate your exposure to the U.S. dollar through foreign currencies and precious metals because we believe that the dollar will be challenged for singular world reserve status. Now, you have the most sophisticated, well-funded investors on the planet de-dollarizing and accumulating gold. You have JP Morgan, who ironically has amassed the largest singular private holding of precious metals ever seen on the planet, quietly, over 950 million ounces of silver and over 25 million ounces of gold. Oh, at the same time, they're uh, facing RICO charges from the Justice Department for, as the Justice Department terms their gold desk, a criminal enterprise. You have 
things happening around the world at the exact same time, like in China. You have China who in 2004 started the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, but a couple of years ago, which no one's talking about and should be, um, they started the Petro Yuan. The Petro Yuan bond is usurping the petro dollar. The Chinese have figured out a way to buy oil and buy natural gas and settle those trades not using the dollar. What they do is they settle it in a bond denominated in yuan. That bond is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai exchange. And that is probably why the Shanghai exchange has delivered almost 90 times, think about that, 90 times more gold than the COMEX market has, which is the price setting mechanism for the world on gold. So in other words, it's as if the Chinese know what's going on. They know the price is being suppressed and they're playing along with it and they are accumulating as much gold and taking it off the market as they possibly can. So you have an answer to the petrodollar. You have the BRICS nations which have now completed a system that mirrors the SWIFT system because if the US wants to penalize a country, they block them from the SWIFT system. Uh, that is really a big deal because since oil is denominated in dollars, everything dollar-based travels through the SWIFT system. It's like they find that bank in France, I think it's Banque Paribas, something like that. Last year, $4 billion for doing business with Iran. So here we are telling another country whom they can work with, whether we agree with it or not, and they fi find them $4 billion or we'll kick them out of the SWIFT system, and of course they paid. Well, it's no coincidence that France has signed up to this new platform that mirrors the SWIFT system, as are many other countries in Europe, much to the United States' chagrin. So take a step back and look at all the pieces in place. You have something usurping the petrodollar. You have something usurping the SWIFT system. You have something usurping the dollar and the treasury market as tier one asset. You have the largest, most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed investors on the planet massively de-dollarizing and accumulating precious metals. You have the most sophisticated, nefarious commercial bank on the planet who has accumulated the largest physical position of gold and silver the world has ever seen, private, private uh, uh, hoard uh, that the world has ever seen. All of these pieces are coming together at a time where I think you could, if all people did was do what the central banks are doing, they would be much, 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 much better protected from what is coming down the pike. And so I guess I'll just simply say this. I view the reclassification of gold as a tier one asset as the most significant event of my 30 year career, hands down, not even close. Because for 30 years, we've been fighting the most sophisticated, well-funded investors on the planet. It's not an easy fight, but now they're on our side. And I think the implications are frightening. I think you will see, if I had to guess, a currency that will arise out of the East that will be gold backed, and it will challenge the dollar for world supremacy. Um, it may not happen overnight, but um, heaven forbid we woke up to find OPEC saying we're going to now offer oil in yuan, ruble, and yen, and, uh, um, and, and euro. Uh, overnight, you would see just how important owning something non-dollar denominated really is and put it on top of a mountain of 120 plus trillion in debt that has been accumulated at the lowest interest rates in the history of human civilization. When things change, it could become quite interesting in the United States we are, and I, I have never been more confident that people who have uh, had strong fingertips and been able to hang on to their precious metals would be glad that they did. Uh, and the central banks are, are, I think, proving that right now. Andy, I want to ask you, uh, this is all amazing stuff. And by the way, uh, April 1st, 2019, the price, of, the price of gold was about uh, $1,290 an ounce. So if we just uh, use the 50 to 100% conversion, in other words, now that they know that they will get double, what they essentially are telling you, every ounce is worth double what it did on April 1st, which is... Uh, 1,291 times two. So at least uh, $2,582 per ounce in the eyes of central banks, uh, because that's what they did. They devalued the dollar by 50% the day they did uh, Basel three and Basel one. So I want to ask you next about uh, ETFs versus physical. 
Uh, we've seen in the last few days that ETF holdings have reached an all-time high and that sentiment for gold has, has reached euphoric uh, 2016, 2011 levels. What is the difference between owning the ETFs and owning physical? Well, there are some ETFs, in fairness, that seem to be um, doing a better job at addressing some of the big issues. Um, uh, the If we look at GLD and SLD, the two largest ETFs, I have always felt that they would be a tool for confiscation. People ask me all the time, do you think gold would be confiscated? And I said, well, I think it would be easier for them to come in and confiscate GLD and SLV, which ironically, SLV, we talk about the fox guarding the hen house, is administered by JP Morgan. That's a, a GLD, and by the way, SLV is the second or third largest stockpile of silver in the world. A GLD is administered by HSBC Bank. And uh, here again, the fox guarding the hen house, it's the fourth or fifth largest stockpile of gold in the world. But the government could come in on a Monday or a Friday night, rather, and close those two funds, pay everyone the dollars that are in their the value that is in the account, put it in their money market. And they could have be sitting on a huge stockpile of gold and silver without breaking any laws or infringing any civil liberties. The bottom line is ETFs are a price representation of the metal. They're not the real thing. And if the, you know what hits the fan, do you want stock in Kellogg's or boxes of frosted flakes? I guess what I'm simply saying is, is that they aren't a sub, they, they are not a substitute for the real thing. They allow people to track the price. But unless you are what is called a authorized participant, you can never take possession of the metal. You can only be paid back in dollars. An authorized participant are the big banks that funded those funds, um, the, the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans of the world. So the bottom line is a, an ETF is an electronic version of precious metals where almost all of them you're not allowed to take possession. Now, I say almost. I do know. I'm not sure which ones. But there are some new ETFs that are addressing that that will allow people to take possession through uh, cashing out of the, IRA, or of the uh, ETF. Bottom line is, I think that when we talk about gold, we live in a digital world. I prefer gold to be more analog, where it's physical, where you hold it, or it's held in a secure depository, fully insured. Um, but to own an ETF is, is only a price representation of the real thing. Andy, uh, do you see the same uh, sentiment, euphoric sentiment in your own business right now? Or is this more of the ETFs right now uh, flying? No, I don't. It's interesting you say that. Um, no, I don't. I, I think, well, I mean, you can look across the globe, Lior, and see that gold is at all-time highs against, I don't know, 75 or 80 currencies right now. So in that respect, most of the world recognizes what's going on with gold. But here in the United States, people are still asleep at the switch. And um, although business is brisk, it certainly isn't euphoric in the retail market. You don't have to look any further than last year's U.S. Mint numbers. They may have been the lowest ever or or in a very, very long time. Um, in 2017, uh, that was the last down year we saw for gold, but it was a big one. And, and it culminated with um, uh, a stratospheric run, not only in the stock market, but more appropriately in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And so there was an awful lot of capitulation in this industry, we are, where people who had been holding it at that point for six years in a downdraft um, got very tired of, of watching other markets uh, take off. And when Bitcoin took off, which was supposedly cut from the same cloth that uh, gold was, it created an awful lot of aggravation and anger and capitulation. And so they are slowly coming back to the physical side of things. But uh, no, I think that this movement has been generated not by retail demand, Lior, but by the, the central banks accumulating it. Um, and they are misdirecting the world by goosing the equity markets um, in a big way. You don't have to look any further, obviously, than the repo market actions since September. If you go back and look at right around September 11th or 12th, when the Fed started injecting billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars into the market every single night in the form of repo loans, which is just another way of calling it quantitative easing, the market's taken off since then, and they're goosing the equity markets and providing cover 
for them to de-dollarize and accumulate physical precious metals when people, at least in the United States, are still enamored by an ever racing uh, Dow Jones and S&P 500 index. So no, I don't. I think, in fact, it's the antithesis of that in the respect that I have value now in gold and silver coins that I haven't seen my entire career. You can buy numismatic $20 gold pieces certified and uncirculated for less than gold eagles. You can buy uh, dimes and quarters minted prior to 1965 for a fraction of what it sold for, for 55, 60 cents an ounce over the price of silver. Uh, there are so many things that I thought I would never see in this industry. You can look at the uh, disconnections and the, um, the price anomalies in, in things like the, the relationship between gold and silver. 86 to one ratio is, is, is ridiculous and unheard of um, to the point where it's only happened a couple times in the last hundred years. I've been telling my clients to consider selling gold and trading to silver um, temporarily until the ratio normalizes back to its 150 year average of about 42 to one. Then you double the gold you started with. In fact, the last time we saw that was 2010, we had 80 to one and within a year, Gold was 2,000 and silver was 50. That's 40 to 1. Had you done that trade back then and switched back, you double your gold without spending any money. We're even higher now. And again, this has only happened a few times in the last 150 years. These are anomalies. You look at the price of palladium as it relates to platinum. This is an anomaly. Or the price of gold as it relates to platinum. Anomaly. Um, there are a lot of distortions and anomalies in the market due to the tremendous amount of manipulation. You know, there's a group I'm sure you've heard of, Lior, called um, Morningstar. And they're the firm that is a research company, mostly in the, in the land of mutual funds. And most of your listeners will have heard of them too. They bought a company a few years ago called Ibbotson, I-B-B-O-T-S-O-N out of Chicago. And Ibbotson was tasked with um, finding alternatives to the U.S. stock market because this interest rate environment that we are in has distorted what was traditionally the alternative to the United States stock market. In other words, it used to be that stocks were considered risk on and bonds were considered risk off. And uh, we would work uh, during our working years, we would put money in the stock market and as we near retirement, we pull it out and we put it into bonds, US treasury bonds. In the 90s, they were earning eight or 9%. You put a couple million bucks in at eight or 9%, you're on easy street. Um, for the rest of your life. But with interest rates where they are right now, not only can you not do that any longer, but the inversely correlated relationship between the two is gone. And that's what Ibbotson and Morningstar, that was the gist of their report. In fact, they went further to say because of this uh, manipulation of interest rates, they didn't use the word manipulation, I am, but let's just say because interest rates are the lowest level they've been in the history of human civilization, not only do, as interest rates rise, do both the stock and the bond market collapse at the same time and the real estate market, which would be devastation to the United States. They went further to say that the only inversely correlated asset on the planet to the United States stock market any longer is precious metals. So you put it all together, all the things we're talking about, the, the precious metals market is not only a life raft as it relates to the United States stock market, but the central banks of the world are showing it's a life raft as it relates to perhaps the end of the uh, singular world reserve status of the U.S. dollar or the beginnings of the end of it. And um, uh, their, their movements are certainly signaling that I'm somewhere in the right neighborhood with these types of uh, declarations. Two quick questions. One, uh, can you in your own business compare uh, 2020 or 2019 uh, early 2020 to uh, 2016 or 2011 in terms of uh, how uh, business uh, was then and now in terms of sales, just so people understand the, the, the difference? 2011, we were getting 200 orders a day. Um, and everyone who, there were lots of speculation, there were lots of small orders, uh, people would call and buy just a few ounces of silver, whatever they could. A uh, business was, was crazy. Um, 2016 business was horrible. Uh, there was there was uh, a period of about six months uh, in 2016, at the beginning of the year, where we saw some decent movement in gold, and in fact, really good movement in the mining shares. I know um, 
an associate of yours, Daniel Amadura, was talking a lot about um, First Majestic Silver in January of 2016, and, and due to his recommendation, I'll never for, forget this, I, I bought $30,000 worth of it and uh, at $3.30 and sold 80% of it um, six months later at 17. That's the power of, of, uh, of a gold market and of buying some equities. And um, you know, the folks at Sprott uh, in Carlsbad, California are the best in the business for that. But uh, in general, 2016 was leading up to one of the worst years we ever had, which was 2017. Uh, 2017, you had to have real strong fingertips to hang on. Um, typically, one out of every 200 orders is a sellback for us. In 2017, it was six out of 10. Everyone was selling throughout the entire industry. And it is that capitulation as Bitcoin raced towards 19,000 and the stock market was taken off and everyone thought gold should too, myself included, and it didn't. In fact, it just meandered and went sideways and down. And that capitulation is what has still created such an enormous product overhang in the marketplace where there are values that I've never seen before. Uh, 2019, <clears throat> we did more business in 2019 than we did in 2011 with 10% of the orders. Uh, we were doing maybe 20 orders a day instead of 200, but most of them, six figures, seven figures, accredited and sophisticated investors. Uh, the mainstream is still not participating. That's it, very it, interesting. Very yeah, I'll tell you what, this virus that's going around right now has created a buzz, I think, where the little guy is getting back into the market. People are scared right now all of a sudden, and they're realizing that, hey, maybe I ought to think a little bit about protecting myself outside the dollar. And so 2020 is so far starting off to be um, very interesting and much more brisk in terms of interest level, in belief. Um, and it's interesting, too, because, you know, the central banks haven't told the public uh, what they're doing, why they're accumulating gold so much. You can see a lot of commentators will say the central banks are accumulating it. And again, I haven't seen anyone but myself talk about Basel III. It's the singular biggest event of my career. And when that is released to the public in mass, that this is what's really happening, that the banks are de-dollarizing, I think you'll see a rush to precious metals. They say, Lior, there is no bull market like a gold bull market for one reason. A equities bull market appears, appeals to our greed. And um, that's a strong motivator, but nothing is as strong as fear. And uh, if you see some sort of an event where the markets collapse or the dollar is challenged or the petrodollar status is challenged, Whatever it may be to ignite the fuse, uh, you'll realize very quickly how important it is to have been proactive in your repositioning, just like the central banks have been doing for the last two years before anyone really hears about it. So it's like the old uh, uh, Titanic. Uh, they said it could never sink, so they didn't make as many life rafts as they should have. And it sunk and people died, I think the lesson to be learned is blow your life raft up whether you think you need it or not beforehand. And um, there are values in the precious metals industry that I, I think are unparalleled right now. But suffice it to say, um, the, there is a change in the air right now, Lior, and it's very similar to 2011. The main difference is in 2011, it was based on greed. We were watching gold head up to 2000 and silver head up to 50. It wasn't yet surrounded by fear. Now, people are sensing it's a different environment, not only with the coronavirus, but you know the impeachment and the geopolitical stuff and the political stuff and uh, maybe the debt. Uh, people are waking up. But I do think that they need to listen to people like you because if you realize that every TV station, radio station, newspaper, uh, and... Uh, a magazine in the United States is owned by four companies, period, then it's easy to see why we're not getting the information that we really should be getting. So um, I think in a nutshell that 2020 is shaping up 
very quickly to to be a, a special year for holders of precious metals as things accelerate. And, and God forbid this coronavirus really accelerates and shuts down the world economy. Uh, things are going to get very frightening on many levels very quickly. So as far as I'm concerned, your listeners need to be de-dollarizing, need to be doing what the central banks are doing. It is very, very, very important. And um, I've never been more adamant about that and never been more confident in the direction that we are, uh, we are heading with precious metals. For, uh, excellent points. I, I love that point about uh, selling gold in order to, to buy silver and then basically your cost basis for uh, uh, gold becomes uh, zero if you, if you, uh, you make a 50% or, or 100% gain uh, comparatively. Uh, silver uh, going down from 80 to 1 to 4 to 1. That reminds me a lot about uh, what Warren Buffett always compares gold to the stocks, which is not the right way to do it. If you just go back to 2016, you tell yourself, hey, do, wanna, uh, do I want to save in dollars or do I want to save in gold? And you'll be uh, up 50% since uh, 2016. I don't have to tell you that you'll be up uh, around um, 4,000% since 1971. Um, Andy, where can people check out your products, how can they get in touch with you personally or your wraps uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to learn everything that has to do with uh, how to buy gold and silver or other uh, precious metals. Um, and then uh, obviously your storage solutions. Sure. So our website is milesfranklin.com. Uh, we have worldwide exclusive Lior with Brinks in Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. Um, we have the only fully insured safe deposit, pro, safe deposit box program in a non-financial institution in Toronto and Vancouver with Brinks. Fully non-reportable to the United States government legally. Um, uh, it's it's a, a, an exclusive and something we're very proud of. Um, we took off our online store, Leora. We don't sell gold online any longer because I'm very concerned about identity theft. Uh, we could spend an hour talking about some of the craziest, most elaborate identity theft um, schemes that we've seen here at Miles Franklin uh, over the last couple of years, enough to make me just shut it down. And uh, we do business the old fashioned way, the analog way, not the digital way. You give us a call or you send us an email. Um, and I think that it's just not worth the risk of identity theft. I, just in a nutshell, the one that made us shut it down altogether was someone's identity was stolen and they sold their house out from underneath them. It wasn't even for sale on a quick deed in California. Somehow they got a, a, a title company to wire $700,000 to us um, in the name of the person's identity that was stolen. And uh, they opened up an, a, a mailbox uh, at, 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 a, at a place under this fake identity. So, you know, you're thinking the, the title company, the notary should have caught this, right? Well, they didn't. Um, and we sent $700,000 worth of gold to this person and were contacted by the FBI a few weeks later when it was realized this person's identity was stolen. The, the ability for, for identity theft to be um, life altering is enough for me to say, you know what, it's not worth it to me to be online. And I think that might happen more and more with the online companies around the country because I, I, to me, it's not worth it. So you give us a call or you send us an email. And as I was talking to you offline, I said that for your listeners, for the rest of the month, if they want to email me personally, not my brokers, but email me at andy at milesfranklin.com, andy at m-i-l-e-s, franklin like ben, dot com. I will beat any price in the country on any product, anything. I will be the lowest price in the country for the entire month to any of your listeners. If they email me directly, um, I'll beat any price they can find, uh, even if I lose money. Um, that's my way of saying thank you uh, to you and to Daniel for, uh, for a long relationship and uh, for the association, which means a lot to me. And um, so that would be my offer. But as far as product, we're one of only 24 companies uh, that's ever been approved by the United States Mint as, as an authorized reseller. Um, we are very high up on the food chain. We work with all the major distributors in the world. We're able to uh, get your, your listeners anything that they're looking for. 
Um, it's important to note this too, Lior, that the precious metals market in the United States is federally non-regulated. Um, the state of Minnesota where we're located is the only state in America that regulates it. Now I could sit here and say to you, we have an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, which we do, that in 30 years and $6 billion in transactions, we've never had a customer complaint, which is true. Your clients or your listeners can try to find one on Google, they won't. I could say to you that we're one of only 24 authorized resellers of the US Mint and that I have lots of connections in the industry, all would be true. And we're proud of that in a federally non-regulated industry, but the state of Minnesota could care less. It's the only state in the country where you have to be licensed and bonded and post or post a bond and be background checked every single year, principals included, myself included. And if any of my staff has a felony related to uh, financial services, they are forever disqualified from the industry. So much so that 99% of the competition in the United States, online competition, will not do business in Minnesota, period. They boycotted the state because they too would have to be subservient to the same set of regulations we are. And when you realize that going back just four or five years, I don't know, north of $200 million was stolen by Tulving, by Northwest Territorial Mint, and by Bullion Direct, three of the biggest, most inexpensive online companies on the planet, they stole all that money. Their, their owners are either in prison or on trial. In the case of Northwest Territorial Mint, they're on, in trial right now. But bottom line is, is that when it comes to doing business with us, you are guaranteed the safest transaction in the industry with a company that has amongst the very best reputation in the industry. And I will personally vet every single email that comes to me. And uh, even though I am going to a very dear friend's wedding in Mexico tomorrow, I'll be checking my email. I'll forward them to my brokers. I'll vet every single one of them. And um, uh, if any of your listeners want to take advantage, uh, I will beat any price by a major retailer in America for the remainder of the month for your listeners. Andy Shekman, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the interview. My pleasure, Lior. Thank you, buddy.